Well, church, turn with me to Romans 12, verse 3 through 8. Uh, If you're new with us this morning, we have been going through Romans for uh, a while. I don't know, it's about maybe two years. Um, We're definitely going on two years. And uh, just just, uh, verse by verse, that's kind of our our, uh, main course at Riverside. We want to just go through the Word of God and um, dig deep into the Word and then take, we take short breaks here and there for topical um, sermons, but for the most part, this is uh, what we do as a church. Um, so yeah, turn with me to Romans 12, verse 3 through 8 is what we're going to focus on. But again, I want to start back on, on verse 1 because uh, this is the context from which the, uh, the gifts uh, are, are talked about is uh, verses 1 through 2. Uh, before we go there, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just uh, thank you that you are worthy, or because of your blood shed for us on the cross and legally separating us from our sin and making a way, uh, Lord, for us to have a relationship with you and then uh, to someday when we shed this broken uh, body that we will be with you eternally, Lord, with uh, no sin and no death and no pain and we just, oh, we long for that day. Lord, we thank you that uh, uh, because of your work on the cross and your resurrection, that you are worthy to open up the scroll that brings forth ultimate victory in the end. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. In your name, amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So last Sunday we focused on prophecy and uh, what is that gift and is it still used today? So that was last Sunday. This Sunday is going to be on uh, specifically the gifts of serving, teaching, and exhortation. We're going to focus on those. And before we get into it, uh, I just want to give some context of just the book of Romans. We were talking about that a little bit in Sunday school. The book of Romans is written to give good doctrine to the church uh, of Rome. And the reason for that, uh, um, Gary was highlighting that this morning, just a little bit ago, that he did not start the church in Rome. It's a church he didn't start. Uh, He had heard good things about them. He wanted to make sure that the doctrine was right, that they knew the gospel, that they knew every every part of the gospel and was able to defend the gospel. He also knew that he had Jews and Gentiles in the church, so he deals with that issue. And that the gospel solves those tensions as well. And it's just amazing how he breaks it down and it's, of course, then circulated through all the churches because it was, it was looked at as, as breathed out by God and And even from the very beginning, before there was any counsel or anything, the church accepted it as inspired. And therefore it is still today, and God uses it as the foundation for the church, along with all of the Bible. But if you you go back to Romans, you just see that, you know, he starts out by explaining that all have sinned, that, that, that even though that people have divine revelation, that they look at creation and they see, it's called natural revelation, they can see that there is a God, they know that there is a God. My cousin is an example of this. He he called himself an atheist for a while, but now that he's come back to the Lord, he says, no, I actually was 
I don't think God ever lay, left me. I, I believe I was saved when I was young, but I just tried to suppress it for like 10 years, 10, 15 years. And I, ne- I spent an incredible amount of energy trying to convince myself that God didn't exist. But deep down, I, know, I knew he did. And so he says, men are without excuse because they can look at natural creation and know that there is a God. And then, even though that they know that there is a God, they suppress the truth. And he goes on to talk about, you know, even those who have the law don't do what the law requires. And those who don't have the law show that the law is written on their hearts because they know what's right and wrong deep in their hearts, that God wrote it on their hearts. And then chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so... You get into Romans 8 where he says, but there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That comes on the heel of Romans 7 where he he says that, he's talking about this struggle of sin. Who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? He's like, I do what I don't want to do. Thanks be to Jesus Christ my Lord. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then at the end, there's no separation. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then going into the, the issue, okay, so what about the Jews? How come they, they, they turned away from God? What about God's promises to Israel? He says God's promises to Israel still stand. There's a remnant still today. And in the end, Israel's going to be brought back in. He deals with that. And then after he goes into all that, he says, oh, how, how rich the, the graces and, and, and knowledge and wisdom of God. Who can understand God fully and who can give to God, though, though God would... Would, have, would need to give him something in return for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever. And that is Romans 11 and then we get to 12. Therefore now, because of God and what he has done for you and his victory, which we just sang about, a lot of those songs we just sang were about the victory that we have in Christ. That he is, he is able to open the scroll and there's good news. And we have to serve a, a risen savior who's victorious over death. And because of that, It's time to get to work. It's time to live victorious. And I was trying to think of a a good illustration, like a a war movie or something. I was thinking about, oh, Lord of the Rings. I'm like, I know that there's a couple times where somebody like gave their life or somebody dies and then it just like infuriates everybody and they're ready to fight, right? It's like, ah, that doesn't really do it. And then God reminded me, I've given you plenty of stories in Scripture. So I went back and thought of David and Goliath. You know the story of David and Goliath. You know that most people, it seems like today, this kind of goes along a little bit with the prosperity gospel a little bit, is that, you know, um, a lot of people, I think, think, when they think David and Goliath, they think, oh, see, David conquered the giant, so I can conquer giants in my life. Like, I'm going to be a conqueror, and I'm going to beat this, and I'm going to have a lot of money, and I'm going to, I'm going to, do exactly what I want to do in life, and I'm going to have this great career, and so I'm going to beat the giants that stand before me. Well, that may be a good thing to do, to beat the giants in your life. That is not what the text is about at all. If you go back to David and Goliath, and you go to 1 Samuel 17, it says this, David says this, and that all this assembly, all of Israel, may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give it give you into our hand. Israel is scared. They're afraid. They've got this huge man with this big spear and sword and, and he's threatening Israel and he's got his army behind him. And, he, and everybody's scared and he's taunting them and he's mocking them. Similar to how they mocked Jesus on the cross. And David said, who is this Philistine that would dare defy the armies of the Lord? He's zealous for the Lord and, and the reputation of his Lord and Savior, his Lord and God. And so he's, he fights Goliath. He hits him with the stone. Goliath falls. What does he do next? He cuts off Goliath's head. And I don't think it says this in the text, but I picture him taking Goliath's head up and doing this. And then all of Israel is like, yeah, and they come running, and the Philistines take off running, and Israel wins the battle. And so Christ did that for us. I want you to put on your spiritual glasses. I was thinking about, oh, I should, I should, I have some illustration here, and I need some glasses. Well, my glasses weren't here, and so Caitlin was sitting by me in Sunday school, so I have her glasses. Right, so you put on, you put on your spiritual glasses, 
okay? And you, and you see, you ask God to help you see things that you don't see. What do I mean by that? Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual forces of this dark world. And so, we see that Christ has won the battle. He's defeated the enemy. The enemy is dead. We are victorious in Christ. And we have good news to share with the world. And we aren't living just for ourselves. And so when we take that lens off, we may not be, be running after a, an army with, with a sword, but we are, in a sense, with the sword of God's word, and it's a spiritual battle that we all are fighting. And so we have to have our eyes open to that. And how do we fight that battle? Well, that's why Paul says here in Romans, therefore, take up your cross. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. You have a great God who loves you dearly, who shed his blood on the cross for you, who rose from the grave and defeated death and made, according to Colossians, a public spectacle of the dark forces of this world when he died on that cross. Just like David picking up that head, chopping it off right for Israel to see. And they're like, we got this, right? We're supposed to have that mindset. And so then he gets into the gifts. A couple things before we get into serving and teaching. We are to be a mercy-dependent people. By the mercies of God, I appeal to you, I urge you, by the mercies of God. And then he goes on to say, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought. And when you are dependent upon the mercies of God, you want to serve people out of this joy and gladness and humility rather than this, like, I'm going to serve all the needy people. I've got it all figured out. I'm a good server. I'm a good teacher. I'm really good at what I do. It's easy to get in a mindset like that and you don't even realize you're doing it. Because when you serve someone, that means there's people that need serving. When you teach someone, that means there's people that need to learn something. When you're exhorting someone, encouraging someone, that means somebody is going through a tough time possibly and you need to lift them up and encourage them. And so it can, in a sense, you can, if the flesh has its way, you can end up putting yourself as if you were above the person that you're serving. I've gone on many missions trips Ecuador and Ethiopia and Haiti. When I, was, when I was in Ethiopia, I just, the Lord had really been working in my heart. I'd been reading a, a book on um, just a radical living with the, for the gospel and loving people. Um, and, and, uh, and I just wanted to, I just wanted to serve somebody who was there. I just wanted to get down and like wash somebody, some poor person's feet in Ethiopia. I didn't, that'd just be weird, right? Just, hey, can I wash your feet? That would just be weird. So I, I didn't do that, but I remember going into this old lady's home, and she, um, she was a, a widow. All of her kids had died from AIDS, and she was taking care of her grandkids. And this organization that our, that our youth group had raised money to support uh, helped her kids get an education, her grandkids. So I went in to her home, and she served me. I didn't know this was, I was just, they were just showing me the people that they serve and minister to. And she made me coffee, and it was the best coffee I have ever had to this day. It was amazing. She, she like ground the beads, the beans with this big mallet. She roasted it over a fire in her home. It was so cool. And then I, I was planning on taking this money that I had with me right after that to go buy a bunch of things to remember Ethiopia by. And the, and the Lord, I was like, man, what can I do for this woman? And the Lord just put on my heart, just give her that money. You know, like she, she's, she's given you a memory that's more important than even just painting on the wall. And so I think it was like, Maybe maybe a hundred dollars I gave to her, and for her, that was like giving her thousands and thousands. And, and she started crying, and just thanked me in Ethi in Amharic, which is Ethiopian. She just crying, and I, 
And I'm like, and after I, afterwards I talked to the, the, um, the, missionary, the missions organization, SIM, and they said, yeah, like you, you gave her like three months of income right there. Um, the American dollar just goes a long way. And you see, when you go into those countries and you have, you, you know that you're rich, it, you can easily tend to serve out of this like, man, I'm, I'm this American coming in here to solve all their problems. And I've seen this happen before at times where you have somebody that maybe in the way you can tell is they're not willing, they don't want to do any of the dirty work when they go. They're taking, they're putting it all over Facebook all the time. They're not really fun to be around because they're just not filled with the fruits of the Spirit. But you see, mercy-dependent people are filled with the fruits of the Spirit because they realize that it's all about Christ. And through having that mindset, the Lord pours into us the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so when we use the gifts of the Spirit, church, we have to be filled with the fruits of the Spirit. We have to have the fruits of the Spirit or else the gift doesn't work. The gift is not being used in a way that's going to really have eternal value. So be mercy dependent. And then recognize that we are one body, many different members. The beautiful thing about the church is that we are one body, many different ethnicities, and many different gifts, in a world that separates. We are one body in Christ. And we are brought together in unity because of our beautiful Savior, who then we obey and we follow his example. And so that brings us together. So you have, in a world where we're separated on, on ethnicity, in a world where we are separated on gifting, if you think about it, you know, Hollywood elites, hang out with Hollywood elites. Business professionals, hang out with business professionals. You know, oh, I just saw Scott, electricians, hang out with electricians. You guys have like your own camaraderie, right? Like, like when, we were, when we were at uh, Mindy's wedding, where's, where's Mindy here? I saw her somewhere. Nursery. So Ian's there. I remember being at your wedding and all your buddies, the linemen, were over there all hanging out in one group, right? That's kind of like normal. But, but like when it comes to the church, we, we are all these different, different um, backgrounds and different giftings, but we are to be working together. When I was talking to uh, Pastor John Norris, once was my predecessor uh, here at Riverside, he said that uh, the greatest divide he saw even in the church at Riverside, was the, was the white-collar, blue-collar tension. And he says it, it really reflected a lot of what was in Decatur. And I, he said that was the greatest divide. He said, but I started to see that get better, and I have seen it get better, even just in our leadership. We have both, I guess, white-collar and blue-collar together, working together, and that's how it should be. Different gifts need to recognize that we are one body, and that as one body, we serve one goal to proclaim Christ with our lives and our words. That is what we are to do. So remember, church, that we are one body. And it's sad to me that so often, even the gifts, because we don't, we're not filled with the Spirit, we're not having, using the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts can even bring about division even in the church. So then you get into the get different gifts. Serving. Notice as each gift is addressed here, he says this. He kind of, like, it's like he repeats it. Okay, if service in our serving. What is that supposed to mean? The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who teaches in his teaching. Why does he just repeat it? As I studied this, there were two different views, really. One view is that he's just saying, be active in your teaching. Use it. Use it. That's simple. It's just a simple interpretation of the text of what he's trying to get, get across. The other one is that he's actually trying to, to bring about what is earlier on in the text, and that is, in serving, do it 
with the mindset that in the context that I just described. Do it in the context that I just described. So, I personally believe it's just simple. He's just saying that to use the gift that God has given you. Be active. Don't just be taking everything from the church and kind of like sitting like, like, you're, like you're watching a game or something, but you're not participating in it. Get off the bench and be involved. And I have found that the people that enjoy church the most and that are committed to the church are those who are serving in some way. And so church, we all need to be serving. Find your gift and use it for the glory of God. Serving is a very broad category. It covers a lot of things. Uh, you think about it, 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 it covers nursery, working with kids in children's church. It covers taking care of the property. It covers all kinds of behind the scenes things that happen in the church, uh, serving coffee, serving food. All of those things are, are serving the church. And if you do that with the attitude, with the fruits of the Spirit, with a mercy dependence, it is a beautiful thing. There are people that I have known in the church that have served so faithfully their whole life, so self-sacrificially, so joyfully. And it seems like sometimes they're not noticed as much. And I just think to myself, when I get to heaven, I may be surprised that that person has much more rewards than I have. Because Jesus said that it is more greater to serve than to be served. And, and he said, the, the Gentiles lord it over you, but for you, no, 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 you are to serve each other. And if you want to be great, be the least. Care about people's needs and do it just because you love people. And so, as we were reading through that book, D.A. Carson, the God who was there, in that book he says, a billion years from now, in eternity, nobody is going to remember Hitler, or Stalin, or whoever else out there that has been so influential in this world for evil, nobody is going, not even going to remember these people, but every cup of water given in the name of Christ will matter. Every single thing done for Christ will carry on into eternity. The little things that go unnoticed it's like Jesus, you know, when you'd have those, those Pharisees that were dropping their money in the, in, in, in the, the thing in front of the church, and, the, and they're doing this in the synagogue. And you had the one lady come in and put her little two cents in. Nobody noticed her, but Christ did, because he knew her heart. And that's what mattered to him. So serve in your serving. Give and serve and love people. And when you do that, you will see that the Bible turns from black and white to color. Like you'll see, this is what I'm missing. I do believe that a lot of times people are, 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 are not really content in their, in their spiritual walk because they're not serving. They're not a part of what's going on in the church. And so he says, use it. Use your serving. Another text, Acts 20 Verse 35 says this. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He's saying we're working hard and we're helping those who are weak and we're serving people, the least of these, the people that... Others don't want to mess with in culture. The early church grew out of that. They cared for the lepers. They cared for people that nobody else messed with because that is what Jesus came to do. And so we are to serve and love people. 
So serving in your serving, that covers a lot of things. The behind the scenes. I've had uh, uh, someone tell me, well, a couple people have told me like at times, and I know they're just trying to be nice, but they said, you know, Pastor, you shouldn't be doing all the cooking or you shouldn't be doing these things. Let somebody else do this. My own uh, uh, son told me once, he's like, Dad, you're the pastor. You're not supposed to be doing this stuff. I was cooking on Saturday night for Sunday. And I said, that's wrong. I was like, that is wrong, man. People probably thought this. And in fact, they did. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, Peter said, what are you doing? And I, I, I told my son, I'm like, buddy, I'm just, I'm just following in the footsteps of Jesus. That's it. I, nothing good that I have done. I'm just wanting to follow his perfect example. If it weren't for Christ and his example in my life, guarantee you, I'd be like, yeah, somebody else is going to do that. That's not for me. That's not my job. Not in my job description. But that is not what we see in Scripture. So, serve and minister. Identify your gift and use it. Teaching. In his teaching. Do you know that, uh, um, while well, deacons have the same qualifications as an elder, the only difference is, is that elders teach. Deacons... In fact, the word deacon actually means serve. You can use that interchangeably in, in Scripture. And so the deacons are, serve, are servants, but it is an honorable thing to serve because the qualifications are really the same for those who are, have a title of deacon in the church as a servant of the church and representing the church. And then teaching is... That is the only other qualification for an elder, and the reason for this is, is because if you have an elder in the church who's supposed to be about the vision and ministry of the church in that way, of being a safeguard for what is being taught in the church, they need to know Scripture well enough that they are able to teach it. They may not even be the best teacher, but they're able to teach it because they know the Word of God and they have been trained in doing so. 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, it says this, where Paul is talking to Timothy, Timothy, and he says this, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will also be qualified to teach others. So he's saying find faithful men and make sure they're qualified and entrust them to teach others. And so teaching is needed in the church, and it's not just supposed to be the pastor. So we have Sunday school and, and, and people teaching youth and Awana and, then, and all other ways. In the park, people are teaching and sharing the word of God in the park. So um, I want you to know, too, that if you're like, yeah, I could never do that, teaching is something that you grow into. Identify your gift. What are you passionate about? If you are passionate about people knowing truth, maybe you should look into teaching. If it's just starting with younger kids, look into teaching. Because what better way to impact society to start in your local church and teach others? An exhortation. Now that one, we don't use that much. What does that mean? What does the word exhortation mean? Went to the Greek on this one, perikaleo, it's translated many different ways. This word is used often throughout Scripture. It is used many, many times. Sometimes you'll find a word that's not used as much. The Greek word isn't used very much. This word, it was just like hundreds of texts, hundreds of times used throughout Scripture. And it's translated a lot of different ways. So I can only give you the full gamut of what this word means. It can be translated appeal, beg, Exhort, implore, entreat, plead, comfort, encourage. It's mostly translated urge, comfort, or encourage. So exhortation is like this is the person that when someone is down and they've had a tough time or they've made it through some tragedy, they go up to that person and they say, God has great plans for your life. And he has brought you through this, and he has something great in store for you. And don't give up. They're encouraging them. They're urging them and spurring them on to do more. Man, this is needed today, church. 
Encouragement is needed. There is so much negativity in our culture. And, and because of that, that negativity infiltrates down into the family and we have negative in our homes with each other all the time. I, I have to, uh, you know, I told Heidi, I was like, babe, I've got to be better at like being more encouraging of our kids because I'm always having to correct them on things. But I gotta, I gotta find what they're doing good and encourage them because this is something that is very needed in our culture and it lifts people up. When, so, when I'm trying to, when I'm working hard at something and I don't know if it's making a difference and somebody says, man, I, I see that making a difference, whatever it may be. It's so encouraging to me. How many of us have been on like a diet or, 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 or lifting weights or running and somebody sees that there's a difference? Because you don't see it. You're just like, you know, you just don't see the change, but somebody else might, and they go, man, you are looking so good, and it just, what does it make you want to do? To do it more. To do it more. You're more encouraged to do it, and so that encouragement is powerful. The, the words of exhortation are needed so much today, and if you're working with, especially with kids in the church and youth, this is a gift that you need to ask God for. Because youth and kids respond to this, and they need this. So exhortation is powerful and very much needed today. And so use that gift. Now, I'd like to share with you uh, some cards that we have. We have these cards back here. Travis worked on them. We kind of worked on them all together. Some of us, um, I worked on many of them. Other people in the church worked on some, on what is on each one of these cards. But these are cards, this is a way you can serve at Riverside. Okay? I hope that after this Sunday and next Sunday, the gifts, there's, no more, there's none of these left out there in the foyer. There's two sides, okay? And it's ways that you can get involved. Especially if you're a member of Riverside. Get involved in serving. If you're not serving. We know that some people have more time to serve and can serve more. Some people don't have as much time to serve, but they can serve some. So everybody can serve in some way. And I, it, there's, there's really big needs coming up. Sunday school, youth ministry, nursery, especially nursery. I want to highlight especially Sunday school, nursery, Awana, and children's church. These are areas of the church that are in need. So Sunday school, we need adult Bible study teachers. We need kids Bible study teachers. We need substitute teachers that can be on call. This involves making sure that you know the word of God, that you're a saved, born-again believer, and that you are a member to teach. You have to be a member to do this. So members, this is for you. But we need people. We have people serving in Sunday school that we don't have any subs for. And so if they're sick or something, we're just in a tough spot, and it makes it difficult. So maybe you could just start being a sub. But I want to encourage you to think about that. Youth ministry. There's a small need there of another youth leader that would, just loves youth, loves to encourage youth and be involved. Go to youth retreats, Wednesday nights, help with youth group, and just love on teens. Nursery, especially. I love this. We are in great need of more workers who love children and would help us in showing our children God's love. You must be able to pass a background check. So that's kind of what it explains. Kind of what you need to go through, what the needs are, how the nurse, what we do at the nursery. It explains that. Awana, the needs there. Of course, prayer, that the word of God would not return void as children hide it in their hearts. Leaders to set good examples of grace and truth to children and youth. We've needed an Awana commander for a long time. This is... I was told this last week that I'm the Awana commander. I said, I'm not a Awana commander. I mean, I kind of am over Awana because I'm the senior pastor. I guess I'm the Awana commander now. But we've needed Awana commanders for a long time. Ever since I've been here, Rod and Lori did it for quite a while. And they just did a great job with it. But it's, it's someone that knows the inner workings of Awana and understands that and wants to take on that leadership role. Awana leaders, we need people to lead games, listening to kids to say their Bible verses. Just listening to kids say their Bible verses. And being kind, but also making sure they know it. Possibly teaching a Bible story if the leader is comfortable and gifted in teaching. 
You got children's church. You got kids from fours and fives in kindergarten to teach them about Jesus through Bible stories mainly. And then kids first grade through fourth grade in loving on kids and teaching them Bible stories. We need people either once a month or as a substitute. We need people to help with that. So those are all working with the kids, and those are big coming up. Also, property stewardship, gardeners, handyman. Consider taking an area of the church that you can be responsible for its care. We've got a couple people that do a lot of this, property stewardship. Caring for the church building. This could be a good service for families to even garden together. That's an example. Outreach ministry, servers and cooks. We need people who want to come serve. We want to share your testimony. Come share your testimony. Cook some food. If you want to donate some money towards it, donate some money towards it. Those are just a couple. And there's many more back there. That may be overwhelming to you. Like, whoa, that's a lot of stuff. We do a lot for the small little church that we are, only by God's grace. But church, we need everybody. The reason why I want to share these is because it kind of gives you an idea that the church needs everybody. Like it's not supposed to be 10% of the people are doing everything. We need everybody. And not only so that we can do all these things and do them well and that people don't get burnt out, but also because you will be blessed when you are serving in the way that God has gifted you. So I want you to think hard, church, about what your gifting is. What is your gifting? How do you identify your gifting? What are ways that you identify your gifting? Let me give you some, um, it's not, there's no magic formula, but let me just give you some, some wisdom, I believe, that's from Scripture on how you can identify your gifting. One, what are you passionate about? Like I said, if you're passionate about people knowing truth, then maybe you need to start teaching little kids. Okay? Again, that one, you, we need to make sure that you're a born-again believer and that you know the word of God, and that you've become a member of our church. What are you passionate about? What are you good at? Do you use it outside the church? What do you do outside the church? Use that passion to minister to the church and the needs of the church. Prayer. So what are you good at? What are you passionate about? Prayer. Ask the Lord until he makes it clear. Ask the Lord until he makes it clear. And sometimes we don't, because of our flesh, and the Lord will bring this to the surface, we don't want to serve because of our own flesh, whether it's our own comforts, it's distractions that have gotten in the way. Maybe, maybe you've done it before and got burned. Maybe you're like Jonah. Jonah was very good at teaching and preaching. And God wanted to send him to Nineveh. It's like he was so good that he didn't even want Nineveh to repent, and they repented. It's like, wow, that must be nice. Like, I want people to repent, and they don't repent, you know. Like, he didn't even want them to repent, and they repented. But he didn't want to do it. Why? Because he had this grudge against the Ninevites. And so his flesh was getting in the way, but God still wanted him to use his gift to serve and to do what, what, what he was supposed to do. So let God search your heart. Why? Maybe if you're if you just feeling like, I, just, I know that I should do this, but I just don't want to do it. Ask him to turn the should to into the want to. Ask him to help you identify why you don't want to. And as he identifies that, and as he searches your heart, I truly believe, I found this to be the truth for my own life, that should to turns into a want to. As you, as you offer up your body as a living sacrifice to God. So ask him to do that. And then seek godly counsel. So when you identify something, you're like, man, I, I think I need to serve in this way. Come talk to to me, one of the deacons maybe, Travis, and just say, hey, I think I'd like to serve in this way. And, uh, and, then, and then let us kind of pray about it, and we'll hopefully be able to give you some wisdom on that as well. Now, having identified your gift does not mean that you only focus on that gift solely, and that is it. I'm only going to do that. Like you can, God can use you in another way as well. Because we are all on one team. You know, it's like uh, 
in, on a basketball team. You have different positions. You have different functions. You have the point guard, and he's about dribbling the ball. You have the wingman. They're, they're going to be more your shooters. You have your post players. They're the big guys that get to battle it out against another big, hairy, sweaty guy inside. I always do that my whole life. It's just wonderful. Um, but that's their job. But you can step out of that. Like, you want a big guy who can shoot. You want you develop other, other, other giftings as well. You want a point guard who can shoot. They focus on their gift, but they can do other things, and they keep their eye on the main goal, and that is what is the key thing here, church. You know, Michael Jordan could have been all focused on, I'm the only guy who can shoot. I'm the best shooter. I'm the best. I'm the, give me the ball. I'm the guy that needs to score, and he did, and he did very, very well for a long time, but he never won any championships. You know when he started winning championships? When he started recognizing, I've got a team that I need to use and utilize their gifting. And so he would tell Steve Kerr, hey, they're guarding me like crazy. You're open. Be ready. Steve Kerr's, I'm ready. Passing the ball, swish, makes it. And he shares that. Because why? His goal is not about Michael Jordan being the best player in the world. His goal was to win games and to win championships. And for us, it is not about me having it my way and getting all the praise or anything. Rather, it is about the church going forth. It is about the glory of God. And that's what, it, the, that's what it's all about. It's about moving the ball forward. And so we have to keep our eye on that. As we sing this last song, King of Kings, I love the words in this song. I want you to think about these words and how they relate to your life. It says this in this song, The church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Spiritual gifts. The Spirit, He lit the flame. He wants to use you. He wants to use this church to minister to each other, to be a light to this community, and to minister to our community. God wants to use you. The Spirit lit the flame, and the church of Christ was born. This gospel truth shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, by his spirit, I am free. Notice the church's mission to share, defend, teach, the, and live the gospel. This gospel truth of old, it will not kneel, it will not faint. It's going to go forth. And may we keep our eye on that and use our gift and in using our gift, we praise, not just in song, but in word and in deed, we praise who? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit with our lives. Church, that is what you are called to do. If you are a born-again believer, you are called to be a part of the church, serve in the church, use your gifting, and lay down your life for Christ and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would help us to use our gifting in the church. But I thank you so much for, even though we are a small church, Lord, we have people that are, that are serving and love you and want to live for your glory. And because of that, we're able to do things that we would not be able to do if it weren't for you and how you have led people in this church. I pray that that would uh, grow. But I pray that this year, with uh, Sunday school starting up and Awana and, and all of that, and people getting out of the summer routine and back into the normal routine of life, Lord, that we would see fruit. Lord, that we would see growth, both spiritually and new people coming and kids getting ministered to and and, and growing to love and serve you in a world that is get, becoming increasingly confusing and chaotic and broken and negative. And Lord, that we would be that light that you've called us to be, all for your glory. So Lord, as we sing this song, that is our heart's cry. In your name, amen.